Hello, Hill Ministries online community. We're so glad you've joined us in our services today. You know, Brian, John 117 tells us that Moses brought us the law, but through Jesus Christ, we realize grace and truth, or as one version says, um, undeserved kindness and truth. Um, it is our desire today that wherever you're at, you will feel the power of God, and more importantly, that you will experience the life-changing power of God, that he will help you through whatever you're doing, that uh, if you don't know him as your personal savior, you can realize that today, you can realize that grace. Yeah, I love it. We know that we're separated by a screen, but we believe wholeheartedly that God's presence and God's spirit is right where you're at. So we believe that for you. Let's get right to worship. Amen.
Hey guys, real quick, we like to just take a brief moment and just kind of let you know what goes on here from Sunday to Sunday at the Hill. Uh, we have a lot of groups uh, that are, you know, interest specific. Uh, that happen throughout the week. So on Tuesday nights, uh, we usually have stuff for the ladies. On Wednesday nights, youth and young adults. Thursday nights, we have an adult Bible study. Uh, and then again on Sunday morning, in person, we have another adult Bible study right. before our main service. So if that is of interest to you, we would love to see you here at the Hill uh, in person if that allows. Uh, we also, of course, know that online works well as well. So we just like to present that to you for what it's worth, but let's get right back to worship. We love you guys. That's right. Amen. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that are never enough that you came along and you put me back together now my every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing that's better
nothing better than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing in this world is better than your relationship with Him. Nothing in uh, nothing that this world produces is better than your relationship with Him. And, and to be honest, what will we what do we hang to or hold to or or love in this world that's better than what Jesus Christ has given to us. We hold on to these little tiny things that give us pleasure for a season and we neglect the greatest gift that God has given us. And that's the ability to be in communion and relationship with Him. Today, I hope that you will come to a realization before the end of this service that the most important thing in life is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this day and for the opportunity you've given me to speak, Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you bless and anoint this time. Open the hearts and minds of these people, Lord, I pray as I share your word with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Roger kind of stole my line. Welcome to the hill. I like it, though. He does a great job. We are blessed. We are truly blessed to be here on the hill in this building, worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to give me today just a fraction of your week. Now, when I say that, I'm only asking for a fraction of your week to give me your attention, your mind, your thoughts. You know, we got seven days, 24 hours in a day. We've got 1,068 hours in a week. We've got 10,080 minutes in a week. Give me 0.496% of your week. When, when I put it in that percentage, less than 1%, just less than half a percent, could, could that change the way you live your life? Oh, it has. <laughs> it has over the past couple of years. But just give me a, a small percentage of, of time this morning to minister God's word to you. Give me, give me 50 minutes or less, and I'm going to look at my clock here. I'm going to see the timer's going up there on the, on the board. Uh, so give me 50 minutes or less to give you something that would change your life for the rest of your life here on this earth and for eternity. Give that to me today. Today I'd like to read an anchor verse for today's message, and 
this isn't just the anchor verse for today's message. I want this to be the anchor verse for the week. I want you to go back and read this verse throughout the week and let it, let it sink in and let it change your life in a powerful way. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Romans 8, 1 through 8. I'll give you a chance to get your Bible. Some of you, electronic. Uh, uh, if you have a regular Bible, we're going to need a little bit of light on to get uh, the regular Bibles out and read them, but it'll be on the board also. But Romans chapter 1, or chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His Son, His own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. Dear Holy Father, anoint me to speak what you would have me to give these people this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, I can tell you what a powerful scripture I've given you this week, uh, for this week, and even this morning. Not, not only for today, but I want this to carry you through the week. I want you to go back and read that every once in a while, because we need to become aware that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We need to be aware, though, that if, we, if our hearts and our minds and our lives are built on the things of this world, on the fleshly desires that we, that we all have, because we all have fleshly desires, who has a fleshly desire? Okay, half of you are sinning right now by not raising your hand. We all have fleshly desires. And, and the key is, is to not have our heart and mind set on the flesh, but on the desires of God. God has a plan for your life. And I'll tell you right now, if you'll give your heart and life to Jesus Christ and all those evil desires, those sinful desires and lust. ultimately he's going to provide you with the pleasures that you don't see in this world anymore. We have pleasure for a season in this world, but God has a mind that he wants to put in you that, that gives hope and healing and pleasure to you all the time in all things. I see pleasure in more things today than I ever did in my youth. Because why? I was seeking after certain pleasures that God had forbid for me to have. Oh boy, I'm getting deep now. I'm going to step on a lot of toes. But let me tell you, this is a powerful scripture I want you to keep reading over and over throughout the week. I know we have a Bible reading plan, but this won't take but a minute every day to read through Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And, and to get it deep into your heart and to your mind. See, I got up this morning... And before I left the house, <clears throat> I put on clothes for a multitude of reasons. I knew that would get some of you. And some of you took a few minutes to catch on. But I put on clothes for a multitude of reasons. Uh, uh, everything from age to weather. Yes, all those things matter. But I put on clothes, I put on a covering, I put on a shirt and pants and a sweater and socks and boots. And, and you think you see Tracy up here, but in reality, you're looking up here and you're seeing Hagar pants and a shirt. You got a, I got a redhead uh, uh, sweater on. I got a Cabela's socks on, which you can't see, but they're too warm right now for me. And I have red wing boots. Now, you look at me and you say, I see Tracy, but you see a covering over me. And we're grateful for that covering over us, right? Amen. Praise the Lord for the covering. But <clears throat> that's, the, that's what we have to be in Christ Jesus. When people see us, yes, they'll see you, but are they seeing Christ Jesus in you? Is Jesus covering you? 
Paul gives us the most powerful way to apply the Word of God to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, or Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. He says in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation. And we get hung up on that. We like the fact that there's no condemnation for those who are, here's the key, in Christ Jesus. I'm in these clothes and you're grateful for that. You're in your clothes, and I am grateful for that. I know there's, there's people that say, to, to do public speaking, you just imagine you're carrying your people without any clothes on, and, and you, you're then better than them. And no, I don't ever do that. I just, I just look at you for the clothes that you're wearing, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> what a distraction that would be. But are we in Christ Jesus? Are we, are we truly in Christ Jesus? First of all, let's get the condemnation thing down. I, I, I asked you the question, is condemnation good or bad? And most of you would have an answer for me right away, but I want to I define condemnation. The act of condemning. How many like to be condemned? Don't answer right now. The state, the state of, 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 of being condemned or severe reproof or strong censor Synonyms for, for condemnation would be this, censor, denunciation, rebuke, reproach, castration, not castration, castigation. I knew I'd do that. That's another bad one. Let's fix that on the tape if we can. It's already out there. I'm in trouble. Chast, that, that's coming from the, not putting on clothes this morning. That's a, here we go. Chastisement. Damnation, punishment. When I say these words, uh, most of us at least, when I ask the question again, is condemnation good or bad? I will answer it like this. Very few people ever want to receive condemnation. Very few people do. It goes against our fleshly nature and pride to be condemned. This is why we love the scripture. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. No, zero condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. The powerful scripture we just read is, is quoted, is proclaimed, and it's used. And, and let me even say it's misused to encourage us. But it's also at times used to justify our sin. We'll sin and we'll say, well, there's no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ Jesus. Today, I want everyone to live in Christ Jesus. I want you to live in Christ Jesus. To know that, that there is no condemnation for those that do live in Christ Jesus. I want each of every one of you to know there is no condemnation before the Father in heaven to all that live in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those that live in Christ Jesus. But I also want you to understand the difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction is not condemnation, but anyone who mistakes conviction for condemnation and does not yield to it is not living in the spirit that Romans talked about, that Paul preached about. We say, well, I, I, I don't live in condemnation. I, I, don't, uh, I don't live in conviction. I just live for the Lord. And you can, at some point, become up to a place in your life where you live in condemnation. Without Jesus Christ, all mankind, all mankind lives condemned, a condemned life of faith, a flesh, sorry. Without Jesus Christ, all mankind lives a condemned life of flesh. We love to quote the scripture in John chapter 3, verses 16. Through 18, I'm going to read today. It says, For God so loved the world. How many know this one? Amen. Oh man, we see it all over the place, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We love that because we focus on John 3 16 all the time, but we fail to teach the cost of not living in Jesus Christ. We love, we love the love. You love the love because if someone loves you, it builds up your. Pride. 
There is good pride and there is bad pride. I do not have time to go into the, the difference right now, but I've got to tell you, it's good to stroke people every once in a while. People need to, to feel loved. I need to feel loved. I feel loved. I've got to tell you, uh, over Christmas, I thank you for the gifts and the cards and the, and the well wishes and the, and the eating cards. We've already begun to eat out more because we have these nice gift cards. But, but uh, somebody dropped off a mug at my door. I don't know who did this. It's, it's, a, it's a mug, Charlie Brown thing, and there's no name, there's no card, there's no nothing. If you did that, I want to know, okay? I'm really curious. It's bothering me who put it in my, who got in my, who got to my office door uh, and did that. I'd like to know who did that uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, one of them is I appreciate that, that little mug so much. But we love, we love to be loved. We also need to read verse 17 because if we take one scripture, we can take one scripture and we can take it totally out of context. And we can live our lives on little sound bites of scripture and they be meaningless to the whole gospel of Jesus Christ and the whole word of God. And John 3.16 is one of those verses that can, that can do that to our world. Oh, it's all about love. It is all about love. But it's not a love that we define. It's a love that God has defined. We go on to verse 17. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Oh, thank God for that. To condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He loved us so much that he sacrificed. And he said, I've not come to condemn at this time, but I've come to save. To save. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You can condemn yourself through unbelief. Through unbelief. I ask people of the world today, as many, we, we, we have a growing internet audience, and as I ask the people even on the internet right now, how do you respond to condemnation? I don't know where they are in their life, but I ask that question to them. How do, you, how do you respond to condemnation? This is what we face when we live outside of Christ. This is, this is what we face when we, when we live with Christ, but we're not living in Christ. I explained that a, a week ago or so. You can live with Christ. He's a part of your life when you want him to be a part of your life. He's a roommate. He's a co-pilot. He's, he's somebody out there that, that you, you admire, you look up to, but you're not living in him. Living in him controls you a little bit more. Pe people see him in you. I, I was someplace the other day, and, and I ran into somebody that hadn't seen me for years. I, I haven't seen them. They haven't seen me. They haven't changed at all. I must have changed a lot. <laughs> but you know what? I, went, I, was, I was at a place. Let me just give you a little background. I, I love to, to, to target practice. This may offend some people. I apologize, but I love to target practice. I have a few guns, and I go to uh, uh, Frontier Justice, a little uh, plug there for them, and, and I shoot. Last year, I only got to shoot one time, probably. So uh, I went in the other day and, and got, had a, about an hour of time in the middle of the day, so I ran over there real quick. Uh, uh, the, the range instructor had, hadn't seen me for a long time, come over and talked to me and, and uh, uh, gave me some pointers after I had uh, uh, shot a few times. And he, and he also uh, stroked me a little bit. He said, most guys come in here can't hit the plate like you can on those targets. And so I felt really, really good. But he did give me some more tips and everything. But I'm leaving Cabela's and, and you know, I got, I got a hat on. I'm not dressed like I dressed uh, up here. And this person comes in that, that has been affiliated with the church in years past. And I said, how you doing? I called his name and he looked at me and you could tell he didn't know who I was. There was this blank look on his face because he did. And then all of a sudden the light came on. Once I said a few more words, he recognized the voice, I think. And he said, wow, I didn't recognize you. The beard, the look. 
If I walked in, if I walked into service tomorrow and didn't do my hair and didn't comb my beard and I had my pants where my underwear showed and I and I and I had on just the the oddest clothes, some of people wouldn't recognize me right away. Because I'm not in what I normally have in. Today I want us to be changed by what you're in, not your clothes. I mean, I'm not good. I don't want anybody dressing like me. Although my wife told me today I looked really good. <laughs> but here's the thing. I don't want you looking like me. You've got to look like God has made you to look. I could go a lot of places with that on, on dress, but we're not going to do that. But here's the thing. I ask the world today, if you're in Christ Jesus, if you're not in Christ Jesus, if he's just a part of your life, you're living the way you want to live. And you are condemned. If you have unbelief, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, the Son that was sent for a sacrifice for all of our sins, then you're condemned. For most of us, though, here in this service today, I ask this question differently. Because today, I'm not asking you how you respond to your condemnation that's on you. Today, I ask all of you, how do you respond to the conviction that's on you? How are you responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in and on your life? You say, well, I respond properly. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. But the question is, how are you handling the Spirit of the Lord? How, how you handle the Spirit of the Lord will determine whether you are being convicted or condemned. How you handle the Spirit of the Lord in your life will determine whether you're being convicted or ultimately being condemned. When you're caught in a sin or transgression, how do you respond? I've got Old and New Testament stories for you today, and I'm going to try to get through all of it if I can. I've cut, I cut some scripture uh, yesterday before I sent the scripture over, but there's, there's so many examples of responding to God and His Holy Spirit throughout scripture and doing it properly or doing it improperly. So let's start. Let's start in the Old Testament. Let's start with, I could go to Genesis, I'll save that for later. Let's go right now to, to Israel. Israel was, was, was ruled by God. God set them apart from all the other nations. And, and God, God kept sending them, saying, I'm your king, I'm your Lord. It's part of your doctrine, it's part of your belief that there, there is one God and he is, he's God alone. He's our king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's in charge of everything. We go to him for stuff. We go, we go to him for everything. And ultimately, the children of Israel said, hey, we don't like this. God kept sending guys named judges to correct them because you know what we do is we, we get off base. So God sent judges and they didn't like the judges and they seen how other nations around them were being ruled by a king. And so the Israelite people, they said, give us a king. We want a king. God, I'm sure, is up there saying, I'm a king. I, I'm the king of kings. Why do you need a king there? But they kept calling pleading to God for a king because they wanted to be like everybody else. See, there's a problem when our convictions want to take us someplace and we say, no, I want to be like everybody else. And your conviction says, no, you need to live a separate life. I, I, I go with people, I'm, I'm around people all the time that, that live a little different than I do. Now, do I condemn them for their, their actions? Well, if they're sinful, yes, I do. But I have convictions that many of them know. I follow these convictions. They don't separate me from you. They do make me a little different than you. I don't participate in the same things that you do. But that's because I have convictions that the Spirit of God has given me. And I live in those convictions. The nation of Israel said, no, we want to be like everybody else. And so God gave them a king, King Saul. Samuel warmed against the king having an earthly king in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8. He warned them what a king would do. And believe me, the kings that we have today, the presidents, the leaders that we have today are still doing the same thing. Samuel warned us about having kings. 
So what do we have? We have King Saul. What does he do? At some point in his reign, matter of fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we find that King Saul disobeyed the command of God in the words of Samuel. Samuel was sent to King Saul to speak the word to Saul, the word of God to Saul. In, in, in Samuel, if you want to look at a type and shadow at this event, Samuel is a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit standing before King Saul. And, and King Saul is you. you. Say, I'm not a king. Well, you're a king of your life, aren't you? Some, some of you think you are. And so what, what's happened is King Saul, Samuel has went before King Saul to tell him, you've messed up. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 24 through 28, Saul said to Samuel, after Samuel has condemned him for his actions, for his failure to obey the words of God, Samuel hears the baying sheep and, 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 and he sees the, the king that they, that the, the, of their enemy that they had not destroyed and he, and, he, and he has to condemn the king. And Saul says to him after, his, after he's condemned in 1 Samuel 15, 24 through 28, I have sinned and I have transgressed the commands of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. That's a problem, isn't it? Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. But hold it, he just... He just he just kind of repented of sorts. It's always, it's always easy to say something, but does your heart really mean it? See, it's easy to say a prayer when you feel a little conviction. It's easy to, to, to uh, apologize when somebody has, has told you that you offended them. But is it truly come from the heart? And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away and here's the heart. Saul seized the skirt of his robe and tore it. And Samuel, and Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Slam. Talk about destroy your pride right there. God has taken that because, not, not because you said a nice apology. Oh, return with me that I may worship the Lord, Samuel. No, the apology wasn't from the heart. His heart was still against God because he was king and his pride was showing there. And ultimately, it's going to be torn away from him and given to someone one better, ultimately David. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, we see David playing the harp or playing music for Samuel or for King Saul to, to soothe the, the, the evil spirit that is, that is coming over him. And what does King Saul do? He attempts to kill David. Again, David representing the Holy Spirit and Saul, King Saul representing some of you. How do you respond when you don't get your way? How do you respond when, when the conviction keeps coming on and on and on and you say, Lord, I'm not sure I want to give that up. I'm not sure I want, to, I want to turn this over to you. Response for unregenerate, unregenerate people are generally not coming from the heart. They ultimately are just to get what they want for a short time. When you're told you're wrong, how do you respond? In 2 Samuel verse 11, King David had sinned egregiously against God. You know what happened there? Bathsheba. He had an affair. He kills an innocent man. He, he's, he's, he's a murderer. He's an adulterer. And a prophet of God, Nathan, comes to him in, in 2 Samuel 12 and comes before him. Nathan representing the Holy Spirit. David hopefully representing you. 
David, David, though, possessed what was needed, a repentant heart. What does God love? He loves a repentant heart. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says there that David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. I'm going to take you at the end of the service, hopefully, to Psalms chapter 51. This is the psalm that David wrote after this encounter with Nathan. And it says in that psalm, Against you only, Lord, have I sinned. Now you say, no, he sinned against, he sinned against Bathsheba and against Bathsheba's husband and against the men he, he had do what they did. But he recognized that first and foremost, we have to recognize we sinned against the Lord. When you realize that you're living in fleshly pride, how do you respond? When it really comes to your knowledge, when it comes to your awareness, when you become aware that you have sinned according to your fleshly pride, how do you respond? Jesus experienced an encounter with that illustrates this in the New Testament. And John, the writer of John, potentially his cousin who, who uh, loved him so much, he shared, he was sure that we needed an eyewitness account of this, of how pride can hinder our ability to respond correctly to conviction. And in John chapter 8, Jesus has displayed grace to a woman who was caught in adultery. After that, it says next, we find him in another encounter with religious leaders. If you have your Bibles, want to turn to John chapter 8, verses 34 through 40. He's having a discussion with these religious leaders, and Jesus answers them. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, you talk to the Jewish people of that day, they were never slaves, I know, that's not true. That's not right. But they had a mindset that they were never slaves. Truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you, are, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father. And you do what and and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus is inferring here that Satan is their father, not Abraham. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the work of Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. See, a group of prideful people didn't take conviction well. They didn't take conviction well. You're not telling me that, Jesus I, I'm, a, I'm a child of Abraham. If you're a child of Abraham, then you do what Abraham would do. Right, right. If you're a child of God, then what does that mean? You do what God wants you to do. It, it, they even got personal here. I don't have this in my scriptures on the board, but, but if you turn on down to uh, John chapter 8, verses 44, halfway through there, it says, They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, even God. See, they're, they're putting back all the way back to Mary, saying that Mary was... There's the problem. They got personal in this. What do we do when we're attacked by, by uh, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? If we're not careful, what do we do? We fight back. We push back. We insult. We intimidate. We make God to be lower than He is 
I'll get to that in just a few seconds. In, in verse 58 through 59, it says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This blew their minds, of course. So what did they do? They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I can imagine this just like, you know, he just disappears in front of them and walks out. I don't know how that happened. That's going to be a question I ask when I get to heaven. <laughs> how did you do that? How did, how did you just hide yourself from them and, and walk out of the temple? I'd like to see that on the big screen if I could, Lord. That would be a neat uh, 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 picture there. Here's the thing. They were, they were convicted, and they were convicted to a point that they were not going to accept the Lord's words. And so what was their answer to that? Destroy the word of the Lord. Destroy it. Are you too good for conviction? If you are, you're condemned. If you're too good for conviction, you're condemned. I love what C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity. I've taken excerpts of, of one of the chapters. It says this, There is one vice of which no man of the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty of themselves. There is one fault that makes a man more unpopular, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it, the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I'm talking about is pride. It was, it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete, it is the complete anti-God state of mind. When we have pride, what do we do with God? Pride destroys conviction, which leads us to condemnation. When we no longer feel conviction, we are condemned. When we elevate ourselves over God and over His Spirit, we are perverted. We have perverted God, who God is. And that is the beginning of the end. That is the beginning of the end. A.W. Tozer says this, perverted Notions about God soon wrought the religion in which they appear. The long career of Israel, the long career of Israel demonstrates this clearly enough, and the history of the church confirms it. So necessary is the church, so, so necessary to the church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standard decline along with it. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders a high opinion of God. Proverbs 8.13 The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. I love the first word that he uses here. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. What did, what did uh, C.S. Lewis say that pride was? It was the root of all vices. All sin ultimately comes from pride. We look back to the Garden of Eden. We look back to, I said this this way on Wednesday night, and I, and I caught some people off guard. When we look back to the Garden of Eden and, the sin of, and, and we look at the sin of Eve and Adam. Yeah, some of you didn't catch that as much as others did. We've always, we've always said Adam and Eve, and, and truly it was Adam and Eve, but, but the sin of Eve and Adam. What was the desire that was put in the heart of Eve? Pride. You'll be like God. You'll be like God. 
And ultimately, all sin has come from that. All sin has come from that display of pride that was show, shown in Genesis chapter 3. Wow. Today I want to close by telling you, thank God for his word. I thank God for his word. I thank God for Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not those who live with Christ Jesus. Not those that, 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 that have him a part of their life. But those that live in Christ Jesus. He's, he's my covering. He's their covering. I live inside of him. He doesn't live outside of me. I live inside of him. I was born, I was born condemned, but because of him, I live comfortably in conviction. Mm -hmm. Because of him, I live comfortably in conviction. You say, how do you live comfortably in conviction? Because, because I understand that I'm not condemned, I'm just convicted. I, I'm not condemned. Before the Father, I am not condemned but I live in conviction. Is that a sad place to live? No, it's not a sad place to live. It's like being a, a professional athlete who knows that they have to train their body and, and, and diet appropriately to what? To achieve what they're going to achieve. It's the same thing with conviction in my heart and in my life. I know that conviction is good and powerful for me. I live in conviction because I want to see the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. You guys know who that was, don't you? Even Adam, Adam and Eve. Through one, through one trespass leads to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness... Am I going to respond correctly to every single conviction that's put in my life? No, I'm going to mess up every once in a while. Uh, it, should I be trying to respond correctly to every conviction in my life? Yes, I should. Should I push my convictions on other people? No, I should put, push God's word on other people. Yeah, that's it, that's it. It says, but for the act of one righteous... Jesus Christ leads to justification and life for all men. I thank God I live in conviction because living in conviction, I know I'm not going to be condemned. Living with conviction in my life makes me know right now that I will not be condemned. Why do we find, why do we find some people don't seem to have any of the, any of the struggles that we have in our life that aren't serving the Jesus of the Bible. When we, when, we tend to make a, when we tend to make a God that's not the God of the Bible, what happens is Satan's got them already. He don't need to bother them. Verse 19, for as, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. If you're living in conviction today, you're living in righteousness today. You say, oh, I don't like conviction. Hey, if you're being convicted, you need to thank God for it because you're living in righteousness. Now the law came in to increase the trespasses. But when sin increased, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, I get excited about conviction. I don't get excited about condemnation. But I get excited when the Lord convicts me. Before service, someone came and 
told me a story that happened to them just recently, how God convicted them about something. That I, they gave it up. The first three days were a breeze. After that, they had a little struggle. But you know what? God has what? Delivered them from something that was destructive to them and their relationship with Jesus Christ and destructive to their life. And we rejoice today with them. But here's the, here's the option. And some, somebody's probably, some of you are probably going to be a little leery about telling me stories, but, but here's, a, here's a story I heard from, from somebody in the church this last week. You know, when you do something wrong and the authority in the household comes home, what is your response to them coming home? Is it the same as, is it the same as in the garden? You go hide yourself? Heard a story of two brothers or some boys in the backyard playing with a rope and a tree. And one of the boys, the youngest of the boys, was up in the tree and kind of was falling out, I guess, of the tree and ended up hanging upside down by their feet out of the tree. And dad just happens to pull up as he's hanging from upside down in the tree. What did the other boys do? What would you do? Here's an example of conviction. They ran. They ran and hid themselves from dad. You say, well, uh, what will you do when you're convicted? Will you, will you submit to the conviction that God has placed, or do you run from him? See, he doesn't convict you to punish you. He convicts you to make you better. Today, I don't know where you are in your life. But everyone here probably has dealt with some kind of conviction this week. Up here? Amen. You've dealt with some kind of conviction this week. Did you respond to it like King Saul? Did you respond to it like the religious leaders of the day? Or will you respond to it as David did? And you said, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. Let's stand. Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it And I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall of praise to shake prison walls and I will speak to my fears and I will preach my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now I am standing on your word I'm calling heaven down to earth And you will fight my enemies And this will end in victory And I will believe it And I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall Take prison walls, and I will speak to my fears. Oh, I will preach to my doubts. That you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You'll be faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Oh, then I know you never fail. Yes, I.
Wow, what a powerful service, Brian. Uh, I hope that you have experienced the power of God and felt his presence like we have here today. Uh, and hopefully, as Pastor Tracy spoke about conviction, um, whatever convictions you're dealing with, um, the Holy Spirit will lead you down the right path. Surrender to those convictions. Let God change your life and free you from the bondage of sin. Amen. Yeah, and maybe you're looking for, you know, what next step can I take? That's right. And we want to make that available for you. Um, if you contact us, you can email us at office at thehillministries.church. And maybe this sermon has left you feeling like, okay, what's, what next step should I take? Maybe you need additional prayer. Maybe you need additional discipleship or resources. We want to be there for you. We want to partner with you. So send us an email, office at thehillministries.church. We would love partner with you and, and further you on your walk with Christ. That's right. So with that, we do thank you guys for joining us this week. Amazing service. Um, just a lot of exciting stuff going on here. Uh, we always are honored when we have people join us online. Uh, one last thing I would mention is if God lays it on your heart to support us financially, uh, we do make that uh, hopefully easy for you on our website. If you just click the give icon on the home page, uh, it'll walk you through the prompts to do that. Uh, certainly appreciate anything that you guys are able to do um, it does take money to it does to make things happen that's just you can you also know. download the security of that bike that's that's exactly right and guess what it saves your information so you don't have to re-input it every time you awesome. do it so yeah we love you guys roger anything right. any final words or anything just we love you so much we're yep. so glad you joined us today have a great week ahead god bless you take care